Just hearing the words, you need chemotherapy, can turn your world upside down. I hated telling my patients they needed it. And when I found out I needed it myself, I just felt lost. Would my hair fall out? How bad would it be? Would it work? Add to that the other drugs we give patients, the targeted therapies and immunotherapy, it can feel like treatment never ends. And that's when you need someone in your pocket you can call for help. And today we have Rachel Clifton, a Macmillan Breast Oncology Nurse Specialist. Now I worked with her when I was a consultant at Ipswich and I knew she was the one to answer all your questions. Not only is Rachel an incredible nurse, but she's passionate about raising the profile of metastatic breast cancer with the secondary, not second rate campaign. But there's more. She's even been a nurse advisor for Holby City. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you very much for that glowing introduction. You are welcome. It's all true. (laughs) Now, before I get into my questions, I just have to flag that you've been getting a lot of fangirl love online. One person said, oh, Rachel Clifton, the best nurse a gal could ask for. And I thoroughly agree with that. Oh, bless them. Very kind. But before we start, I just wanted to ask what made you go into oncology? Because it's quite an emotional field to specialise in. I think it was when I did my pre-nursing course, we, much like everything else, you look at various different options. And my mum actually was a ward clerk on a a Colchester ward, which dealt with cancer patients. And I used to go there as a little girl. And it sounds a bit strange but um we used to be invited to go there for christmas to see the patients and just that contact with the patients was where it all started and you kind of find your areas of expertise and your areas of patients that you really want to work with and the breast patients were the ones that i wanted to work with and also it's very Research moves very quickly. Progress moves very quickly within breast cancer. It has got a lot of funding, but it's the fast pace of the research is really interesting as well. So it's, it's incredible. There are 20 new drugs since I wrote my book eight years ago. It's amazing how quickly things are changing. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought we could start with the basics, if that's all right. Um, what is chemotherapy? So chemotherapy is, uh, we can describe it as cell poisoning, which sounds very scary, but that's what it does. So that's why it acts on those live dividing cells. So hair, skin, inside your sort of mucosal lining. So the bits in your, down through your mouth, down through your gut. And, and also the big thing is, is your immune system. So the thing around chemotherapy is to poison those I always call it wonky cells that have gone wrong and try and make sure and encourage them to re-replicate it in a better way, shrink down the tumour size if we're doing treatment ahead of surgery. Yeah. So it kind of, and because your tumour cells are growing much faster than the rest of your body, we kill more tumour cells than healthy cells, don't we? Absolutely. Now, another question a lot of people asked is, who gets it? Why do some people get it and others don't? Are they being left out? Are they being undertreated? So I think it depends on grade of the tumour, it depends on kind of if it's gone to any of the lymph nodes, it also depends on receptor status. So if you've got an estrogen sensitive breast cancer, sometimes it's more likely we'll go for surgery, radiotherapy and anti-estrogen therapy such as tamoxifen or letrozole. If we've got a HER2 positive breast cancer, so it's showing HER2 receptors on the cells, we've got the option of having treatment ahead of chemotherapy with targeted treatment. So obviously we tend to use something called Progetta yeah. and Transusumab. So that makes FESCO. So that's given with chemotherapy ahead. Other things that we'll look at is immunotherapy. So particularly if we've got a triple negative breast cancer. So we take everything into context. We also take age into context as well. Um, it's not to say... You can be a really fit 75-year-old. You can still have access to all these drugs. So everything is taken into context we, and we make it as personal as we can. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It is done on a completely personal idea based on you, your tumour characteristics, your lifestyle, your other medical problems. And we only give it if we're fairly certain it's going to be a benefit. Absolutely. So don't worry if you're having it and someone else isn't. Your doctors use really complicated algorithms to help work out 
whether you need it. Yes. Now, this is a question. Kitty asked me, how do you have chemo? How do you decide whether to have it through a cannula in your hand or through a pick line or a port? Can you just talk us through a bit about that? So it depends what time, type of chemotherapy you're having. It depends how long you're having your treatment for. Many of the chemotherapies will make your veins feel hard and feel horrible. And posh name is sort of fibrosis of the veins. And that can scar long term. It's not going to go away. So we often put in a pick line. We can put in portacasts, which obviously sit beneath your skin. Sometimes that might be for slightly longer treatments. So your go-to and your quick method is really having a, a what's called the pick line. So a pick line for people who don't know, it's like it's like a normal cannula, but it kind of goes into your upper arm just above your elbow and it's tunneled and it goes all the way up into your heart. So you can have the drugs through that. And we can also take blood from it as well, can't we? You can. Because you need so much blood taken during chemo. Yeah. And if you're on sort of some of the more intense cycles that can be weekly, obviously taking bloods each time, having chemotherapy each time, your veins get very sore very quickly. For those ladies also that have had breast surgery then have to go on to have chemotherapy, it's best practice not to use the side, the operated side. It's best to use the side that hasn't been operated on for either cannulation, which we try not to do, or have the pick line put in. So I had a little port, which is like a little plastic device just below my collarbone, again with a long plastic tube that goes into the heart. And I didn't want a pick line because I had a new spaniel puppy and I thought he's going to jump up all the while and pull it out. And also I wanted it underneath the skin so I didn't have the bother about showering and there was a lovely anaesthetist who could put it in. So there are three options and it's worth asking whether what the options are and how you can have chemo just to fit in with your lifestyle really, isn't it? Absolutely, definitely, which comes around sort of tailoring your care and your personal care to what can be done you know, at that time and what device is suitable for you. Brilliant. Now, I know a lot of people are scared about chemotherapy and we're going to talk through all the side effects soon. But one thing I've been asked by Julie is how do you prepare for chemo? She's starting in the next two weeks. And is there anything that she should or shouldn't be doing? Make sure you have as much information as you can handle at the time. There are some very common side effects. There's some very less common side effects. Probably focus on the common side effects. Some ladies in preparation get things ready like a chemo kit ready yeah I was going to say that yeah <laughs> like constipation is always going to be quite a big one so have things available that can help your bowel function so it might be certain ladies say well okay if I have a cup of coffee or prune juice that is my go-to yeah it can be that actually you might need something a little bit stronger so making sure that you've got some laxatives on board Think about your mouth care, so certain things, and we can go into that in a little bit more detail. It's sensible to just think about a sensible diet. Don't go crazy into crazy diets. Think about fasting or keto diet. Just stick to your sensible foods. Hopefully you've been given advice about a neutropenic diet. We can go into that in a little bit more detail as well. But you become very deconditioned quite quickly on chemotherapy. So exercise i'm not saying go out and run a marathon or anything like that but a walk is good for you mentally and physically and it's ensuring that you kind of keep that cardiac function up because it's very quick how chemotherapy can hit you very quickly i was shocked and i was fit and 40 and i think i just want to say it's the other practical side of things so you're probably going to feel really bad for at least a week or so, depending on how often you're having chemo. So having friends who can help with childcare or walking the dogs or delivering meals or changing the sheets, realizing that the house might not be clean all the while, just all the practical things to help you live when you're going to be off yourself and actually getting friends involved can really, really help and make you feel you're surrounded by people to help. Yeah. And I think as well for friends and family, when they feel so helpless is like you say, setting up a rotor. So People feel involved and you're getting them involved, but without them maybe asking you all the questions all the time where you think, oh, I'm too tired to answer them all the time. So like you say, getting people involved to, to help you do those chores that you think, mm, don't really want to be doing them today. Yeah. Now, this is a myth. And I remember asking you when I was diagnosed, is it worth painting your nails black to stop them falling off? Or is that a myth? I think probably a myth, if I'm honest. Uh 
I do ask patients to do certain things like paint their nails so we can see what happens. Now, anecdotally, and it's not to say everybody go out and do it, the best response that I've seen, despite it being contraindicated, is have things like false nails put on, gel nails. It seems to have really protected the nail bed, particularly around what we call the the taxane. So it's if you're having docetaxel or paclitaxel that really do affect your nails. Now, that's the best evidence that I've seen. There are lots of things out there about freeze mitts, things like that. Some of the data is a bit sparse. The thing is, it's much like anything. If your nails are going to be affected, they're going to be affected. Yeah, I tried it. Yeah. And I couldn't be bothered to keep it going for the rest of the month. I just, their life is too short, but it is interesting to see that it might work for some. Yeah. Now let's start with the side effects because you've had so many questions. But first of all, does everybody get side effects and how long does it take for them to start? Unfortunately, everybody is going to get side effects. Like we touched on, the common ones is going to be the hair, which is the biggest one, I think, for a lot of ladies. There are things to minimise that, such as scalp cooling or cold cap. And the way that works will be very different depending on the drugs that you're you're going to have. So ensure that you've spoken to your nurse or your day unit or your infusion team to find out how effective it's going to be. There is certain calculators that you can use that will tell you how good it's going to be depending on the drug and the dosage that you're using. Okay. Yeah. Does that stop you losing your hair or does it just stop you losing some of it? You will still lose some of your hair. So obviously if somebody's got really thick hair, you're not going to see it quite so much as somebody that's got very thin hair or maybe blonde or maybe grey hair where you could see the scalp a little bit more sometimes. So you will still get hair thinning despite using the cold cap. But if you get through your chemotherapy, you're not wearing a wig, hat, turban, the cold cap in my mind has then been successful. We have seen some really good results with our scalp cooling. So it's always worthwhile asking the question. There will be certain units, depending on how busy they are, sometimes they might not be able to use scalp cooling. Or if you're on mobile units, sometimes they haven't got the chair space for them. But it's definitely always worth asking the question about it. And whilst you're on hair, I didn't realise you lost all the hair on your body. I just thought, and I'm a breast surgeon, that you lose the hair on your head. But no, eyebrows, eyelashes, pubes, leg hair, nose hair, all disappears. Who knew? Yeah, absolutely right. I think nose hair is particularly another annoying one because you get a very drippy nose a lot of the time. You do. Yeah, so incredibly annoying. But yes, you're absolutely right. You do lose all your hair. You look like an 11-year-old girl again. So we're going to go to all the side effects specifically later, but I wanted to ask about what do you need to monitor at home? What is important for me to know? Am I doing okay? What do you guys want to know? I want to know particularly if you're feeling unwell, flu-like, shivery, or think, do you know what? I can't put my finger on it. I just feel downright awful. You need to have a thermometer at home. That's part of your kind of kit as we mentioned before yeah to get hold of because certainly if you've got a temperature we look at 38 degrees or above below 35.5 we want to hear from you however if you think I'm not feeling well but my temperature is 36 still ring your acute oncology service you should have been given a card um, from your nurse specialist or consultant for your 24-hour care that is the main thing that I would want to know when you're at home not feeling well. I also want to know if you are feeling incredibly sick because that's an awful feeling. Oh, yeah. I want to know if you're feeling incredibly constipated because, again, that's a horrible feeling. But I try to encourage any of my ladies and my few men as well to call me because what might seem something insignificant or silly to you might be really important to me. Yeah. And I can reassure you... Or I could say, no, actually, we need to see you. Yeah. And I was that patient. So I I had constipation for 10 days. I remember crying on the toilet naked with bleeding piles, trying to force out this rock hard shit, thinking this is horrible because I thought I was meant to be poorly and I wasn't going to ring for help. And if I, they said, why didn't you call us two days earlier? I didn't think I could. And I think it's realizing you guys are there to help 
And if you have a temperature, you don't pass go, you don't collect 200 pounds, you call straight you away straight because in. an infection can be life-threatening during chemo. I think that's really important to bring home. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing that when you're speaking about chemotherapy and you consent to chemotherapy, you make sure that you understand the implications of this because it can be fatal. And that means that means it can kill you. An infection can kill you because your immune system is rock bottom. Yeah, and that's why we need to know about it. Yeah, and what happens because it happened to me, you go in, you get given antibiotics just in case and hopefully it's anything serious. But I will say to anyone listening, pack your chemo bag. The minute you're having chemo, get a little bag with your phone charger, the toiletries that you like, a towel, a stuff, a go bag. I didn't because I thought it's not going to happen to me. And then when you feel as rough as, you can't think about what knickers you want. No. So pack a bag ready to go and hopefully you'll never need it. Yes. But I want to move on to some of the side effects. And we had this lovely audio from Instagram. Hi, Dr. Liz. Thanks for offering to answer our questions. I'm on Fesco every three weeks for HER2 positive breast cancer and solidronic acid every six weeks at the moment. I'm quite exhausted, but that's manageable. I have peripheral neuropathy, particularly affecting my feet, which disturbs me, especially in the evening and during sleeping. My hands were bad, but they're much better. So I'm hoping my feet will improve. If there's anything I can do to help that would be appreciated, any advice. And my temperature, the hot and cold, definitely the hot flashes through the night. Again, that disturbs my sleep. So any advice and support on that. Thank you very much. That takes me right back. Oh, so I think peripheral neuropathy is always a very difficult one. Um, but can we explain what that is to people listening who might not know? We can. Um, basically, it tends to happen with certain chemotherapies, mainly these taxanes that I've mentioned before, mm. so paclitaxel and docetaxel. What it feels like is pins and needles, numbness in the tips of your fingers, so particularly the pads, the bit that, that do a lot yeah and you're feeling but also in your feet and your toes so it can feel like you're walking on cushions it can feel particularly uncomfortable or a bit like if you sat on your leg and then you get up and you think right I can't feel my foot yeah that's exactly it yeah it can be incredibly painful as well the one thing I would say is when you're going through treatment if you have any of that feeling you must report it because you can go through treatment not reporting this and this can go on, it can get worse and sometimes it won't actually get any better. So it's really important to mention that to the nurses that are looking after you or the consultant. So we can bring the dose down on that. Now in yeah. terms of things that can help after the event, so magnesium is very good. You can get magnesium sprays that help that feeling at the, at the bottom of your feet in particular it's really good that the sensation in the hands has started to come back on, on the lady um, that asked the question so hopefully the feet will follow suit so you can use magnesium spray or magnesium butter if it is getting particularly painful obviously you can ask the consultant or gp there are certain drugs that can help such as amitriptyline but sometimes we've had enough drugs and we don't want to go through any more drugs. So I'd be patient with it because hopefully it can get, get better. What flushes, I think, is probably a podcast in its yes. own entirety. <laughs> and I think we'll probably will do one, but yeah. <laughs> there are various things. There are things like chinos. Sometimes, so you, yeah, you get hot and then you get cold and then you don't want your chillo. So a chillo is a pillow that's always cold. You can get them online. They're brilliant. Yeah, you can. Um, it's whether you speak to your clinician or consultant, are there any sort of things that can help in terms of supplements to help with hot flushes? So sage is a good one. It's quite safe to take. It should be absolutely fine with your Fesco. It's not going to interfere with, with anything like that. Obviously, look at what you're, you're wearing in bed. Look at your bed linen to see if there's things like that can help. Separate duvets. Separate duvets was a game changer for me and going to bed in running clothes that wick sweat so they dry really quickly. But um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. If, you know, I put together some menopause packs for my lady. So it goes through kind of different things that you can look at. You can look at your diet. 
how much caffeine are you having, all of those sorts of things that can really help. Let's keep a diary and see how things are because you might be able to elicit certain details of things that are particularly triggering your hot flushes. Yeah, caffeine especially. So I wanted to come back to nausea. Crystal and Jules both asked how to manage the nausea and I struggled. I was given one anti-sickness tablet and then another and then another and then another and I was still struggling. What can we do to help? So it depends. Obviously, we use go-to tablets that we use. We send patients home with three different types of um, anti-sickness medication. Now, I, I find sometimes with some anti-sickness medication, one, it's got a constipating effect. So are you getting nausea because you're constipated? Are you getting nausea because your mouth might be feeling sore? I think it's finding what works for you because it's certainly not going to be one thing that's going to suit everybody. So certain things in your diet, other things, again, that are going to trigger your nausea. And going, if you're still on chemotherapy, there are certain other drugs that we can use that aren't your standard drugs as well. So I think it's finding what works for you because it's really hard to kind of recommend what to do without kind of sometimes knowing the, the specifics as well. I think the take home seems to be if you are suffering with nausea, sickness, constipation, diarrhea, speak to your oncology nurse and say, the tablets you give me aren't working, what can I do? Don't suffer in silence because there is always something else we can try. Yeah, yeah, there certainly is. Danielle asked, what's the best pain relief to take for the bone pain that you can get on chemo? And I, I had this as well. It's just, it's like the worst flu, the worst hangover of your life. Sometimes paracetamol and briefing doesn't cut it. Can you ask for stronger painkillers like codeine? Don't suffer in silence. If you've been preempted about the drugs, we do tend to warn you. And it's again, it's these taxanes um, that keep coming up. So the paclitaxel and the docetaxel, they're the ones that cause a specific bone pain. And it normally comes about 72 hours after you've had your infusion. Yeah. So yes, ibuprofen, paracetamol are good but ensure you take your temperature before taking any of those sometimes like you've experienced it doesn't kind of cut it so codeine is the go-to but it's not a particularly friendly drug because sometimes people get a bit woozy on it particularly constipating as well so don't suffer ring your nurse specialist or your day unit or infusion teams or your consultants to say this is what's happening to me reassuringly it does get better but it takes a while to come out of that black hole again and think right okay it feels a bit better I can breathe again things are getting a little bit easier but certainly don't suffer just call up and then the team will know to give you those stronger painkillers for the next cycle so hopefully it doesn't happen definitely so anything that kind of happens it's going to happen again on your next cycle so get it nipped in the bud so you've even if it didn't happen for instance you've got it there and I think sometimes if you've got things there ready it makes you feel a bit better and a bit more confidence going going into the next cycle definitely that's safety net you know another thing we had a lot of questions about that hit me because I was a fit 40 year old triathlete when I I had chemo the exhaustion the bone crushing fatigue I cannot raise my head off the bed now a lovely lady who's now died told me that I should go for a walk every day for half an hour. I don't believe you, but it did make a difference. But some days I wasn't getting out of bed. Any tips to help with that bone crushing fatigue? I think you've described it adequately. <laughs> I think we, um, we try to say, get out and get doing. But like you said, sometimes you just can't do it. So don't be hard on yourself if you need to rest then rest the walk will still be there tomorrow but it could be something simple and a very small win if i walk up a flight of stairs i might still be woof, out of puff but i've done it if i've walked out the door and come back in i've done it it's very small wins but when you're in that depth of this bone pain is awful everything is awful mouth's awful i don't want to move off the sofa off the bed then don't because tomorrow will be another day 
Exactly. And chemo affects people differently. There are some people still training for marathons during chemo and other people who literally cannot get from the sofa to the bed. And I had cycles where it killed me. But when I could, I would walk with a neighbor at six o'clock in the morning before she, she took her kids to school. And then I thought I've earned the right to lay on the sofa all day because I've done my steps in the morning. So be kind to yourself, but try and move when you can. Absolutely. The following on from fatigue and something that can make it worse, Irene and Kate said the steroid insomnia. Oh my goodness, who knew? What do we do about it? Yep, not a lot you can do about it. Why do we give people steroids with chemotherapy? We give them only, again, with the, the taxanes, the paclitaxel, the docetaxel, to try and stop you reacting to the drug. Because sometimes you can get a hypersensitivity to the drug. So the reason why we give the steroids is to try and stop that reaction happening. So you can take the steroids all up front. So it seems like quite a lot. You've got quite a few tablets to take, but you can take all of them at breakfast if you want to, which means that you might not be feeling as awake at like night time. Yeah. Sometimes even doing that, it doesn't work and you will be awake with the fairies. I would say, Get all your bits done. You know, if you need to be doing your cleaning, do it. If you need to be doing some knitting or catching up on some TV, do it. Because you might not feel like doing it once no. you've had your treatment. So, And I've learned it, that. Yeah. And some people are very, very sensitive to steroids as well. So it's not just the staying awake at night. It can really affect you emotionally. So again, speak to your team about it because we can do certain things about it around sort of prepping the medication maybe in a slightly different way or sometimes giving the the steroids intravenously as opposed to orally that you go home with and tapering them off slightly differently after you've had the treatment. I remember it drove my husband mad because he was saying just go to sleep you don't understand my brain is buzzing and the biggest thing I learned as you said don't fight it get up do something, you will fall asleep eventually. And it's only for the first three or four days until the steroids go out the system. Yeah. Now, the next thing I want to talk about that I didn't realize was important is mouth care. And I'm suffering now on palbocyclic, but it's really common with any of these targeted therapies. Just how important is mouth care and what should we be doing? Really important. So it's a good idea to have a dental check before you start your chemotherapy if you've got time. So if there is anything that needs to be done, any fillings or anything, that's done ahead of your chemotherapy because if there is any dental decay, sure, that's going to be a problem within your mouth and especially when your immune system's a little bit low as well. Yeah. Use your normal fluoride toothpaste. Use your soft bristle toothbrush. Use salt water. You can use things like cortisol or Listerine, but make sure you dilute that down because if you use it neat, it's going to like, you're going to be jumping it's around horrible. all over the place. Um, if you get oral thrush, so it looks like a coating on your tongue, it looks very white and sometimes ulcers, we can, can give you medication to help with that. If you've got a real breakdown, so all parts of your mouth are feeling particularly sore, Sometimes we need to give you some different um, analgesia mouthwashes um, to help with that, which are more specific sometimes to the hospitals as opposed to the GP. The best thing I did was use a baby toothbrush, so it's really, really soft. And I, I couldn't stand the taste of the fluoride toothpaste when my taste changes, so I used biotin or oral leaf toothpaste. Yep. There are things available. But why is mouth care so important? Why does it matter if we have cracked gums? I mean, it's just going to be a bit sore, isn't it? So it is going to be a bit sore, but also it's an infection risk as well. Uh. So, yeah, so we want to make sure that actually our lips feel okay. It's unlikely that, that your lips are, are going to cause an absolute systemic infection. So meaning going back to like the sepsis that we spoke about. Yeah, and the temperature. Yeah, it's really important that somebody has had a look in your mouth as well because that is going to be your place if you're going to get an infection it's going to happen and that is going to be the thing that is going to bring you into hospital. Yeah. And I got into the habit, I had a toothbrush upstairs and a toothbrush downstairs when I didn't have the energy to go up. I brushed my teeth after every meal. I used a mouthwash and oh, your, your lips get really cracked. There are so, I loved Lano lips. It's a brilliant kind of sheep lanolin ointment. There are lots available just to stop your lips cracking because life can be miserable 
when your yeah. mouth is sore and everything tastes horrible. It is, and it tends to really happen right in the corners as well. So it's only that slight movement, and then you've cracked them again. So anything like that, Vaseline, I'd say stay away from because actually it's not so good, but certain lip balms are going to be sort of slightly better. And use them from the beginning. Don't wait for it to start. Absolutely. Use everything up front. I thought when I had chemotherapy, I would be spending five months at home not leaving the house. Can you have a normal life during chemo? Can you still work through it? Can you still see friends? I say yes. Some of the consultants say no. Um, so, I believe you. Yeah. So I very much would like you still to live your life, still to go out. Now, see your friends. Obviously, if your friends aren't feeling too great, they've got a bit of a cough and the cold, hopefully they'd cool off anyway. But go out, still do your social events. Now, if you said, actually, I want to go to London and I'm going on the underground, I wouldn't be so keen on that because people are right in your face. And you don't want to get an infection. But no, there's often a week in the cycle or a few days where you really need to avoid people who might have bugs, isn't it? Definitely. And it's always hard to predict when that's going to be. So sometimes it's a complete blanket. But if you are adamant you want to do things in this day and age, mask up, anti-back, just be sensible and just be cautious. But it's very important to keep your social life and the bits that you're doing because Having a cancer diagnosis and being on chemotherapy can feel incredibly isolating. Yeah. And you want to know what's going on outside. You don't just want to talk about chemo. You want to talk about other things because your life will come back to normal. And I think it's really important to know life shouldn't stop. Absolutely. You need to still feel like you despite everything that's going on. And that's so important. Yeah. And it's also still, it's still having that confidence to do things because obviously facially you look different. Your hair might not be there, but just have the confidence to get out and do because the more you get out and do, sometimes the better you, f you, you feel about things. And I'm not saying just do that every day. We've established there are days where you think, don't want to see anyone, don't want to talk to anyone. That's okay. You've got permission to do that. Absolutely fine. I guess it's that sense of hope that life will come back and you will get there. You will. But I think for anyone listening... This all sounds pretty horrible. Chemo makes you feel like shit and it can be very scary to hear all about this. And I hope you've said there are lots of things we can do to help make it not be as bad as you think. Yeah. Have you got any reassuring tips or advice for anyone who's about to have chemo? I think listen to what the professionals say. Don't Google because if you Google, you're going to take yourself into a place where you might not be able to get out of. And, and I think... Or Google the right people, I guess. Google the right people. But I think sometimes you put certain things in the search engine and it can take you to different places. Oh, yes. So Google Macmillan, Breast Cancer Care Now, Cancer Research UK. There is um, Cancer Care Map as well, which is a really useful resource. So really refine what you're looking at. It all sounds absolutely terrifying and it's this fear of the unknown before you get started. Once you get started, sometimes it doesn't feel quite as bad as you expected it to be. Um, but there will be those moments, those days where you think, no, I can't do any more. I don't want to do any more. But you pull yourself back and you do it all over again you do come out the other side and it sounds like a long time if it's four months worth of treatment it can be six months worth of treatment it sounds an incredibly long time but it does go quite quick at the same time and then it's coming out the other side and I think sometimes the coming out the other side often six months a year from having treatment is kind of when the realisation of everything that you've been through comes threading back, but some of those fears start to creep in as well. So fears of recurrence, fears of metastatic disease, fear of going back to have my first mammogram, fear of where is my new normal? Who am I now? I've got to re-identify myself because... I can no, no longer do the job that I used to do. So there are many things that you're going to go through, but there is a lot of support 
out there. So make sure you grab the support when you need it. You're going to need some of it. You might not need any of it or you might need all of it, but never be shy in coming forward. Brian, you're not alone, are you? No, definitely not alone. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's been the most incredible chat. I will put the links to all the references you mentioned in the show notes. And on behalf of all my listeners, thank you for taking the time just to put our minds at ease about chemo. Thank you. Thank you.